elongation phase of translation in eukaryotes. The mechanism of elongation phase uh, is quite conserved between, back, uh, between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes, with the difference being in uh, the elongation factors that are regulating the mechanism. So let us look at the learning outcomes of the session. So as soon as the ATS uh, initiation complex is formed, due to a regulatory mechanism, an ATS elongation complex is formed, which would have the initiator tRNA on its P site. And the A site is free for a cognate tRNA to come and uh, position itself depending on the codon that is present at the A site. The elongation factors EEF1, this has several components that is why a group enable filling up of the A site with the cognate tRNA and the proper decoding is ensured by the ribosome. The ribosome along with the elongation factor together contribute to fidelity of the translation mechanism and the elongation factor EEF2 shows biomimicry and facilitates the translocation step of the elongation of translation. When one goes through each of these steps, it is very evident that these steps are absolutely similar to what is happening in, in the prokaryotes as well. So let us look at how from an ATS initiation complex, the entire ribosome machinery moves to ATS elongation complex. So in case of initiation, uh, what, is, what is very uh, clearly observed is that a 48S pre-initiation complex is formed and this pre-initiation complex is able to interact or bind to the 60S and EIF5B. So this binding of the 60S to the 48S forms what is called as the ATS initiation complex. Now with the interaction of the 60S with the 40S, there are several conformational changes that lead to hydrolysis of the GTP of EIF 5P and with the with the remove with the hydrolysis to GDP, the EIFP releases itself from the ATS, and with the release of the EIF5B, the ATSIC that is initiation complex is now converted into ATS elongation complex. So, therefore, what is very clearly observed is that at the P site is present the initiator tRNA carrying the initiator methanin and uh, uh, the A site is completely free for a cognate mRNA to come, uh, a cognate tRNA to come and bind. So, uh, what, is, what is important is that the uh, in the open reading frame, the start codon is associated with the initiator tRNA and the second next codon is present in the A site and that codon can be read by a cognate tRNA. So the stage is basically set for elongation of translation. Now let us look at how elongation initiation by the elongation factor 1 comes into play. So elongation factor 1 in the eukaryotic system, this small e represents eukaryotic system and elongation factor EF1. Now, the EF1 is basically analogous to the EF2 in the prokaryotic system. So, the role of EEF1 is similar to the role of the elongation factor T. The elongation factor 1 has two main counterparts EF1A and EF1B. And within EF1A itself, you have again two subforms. Now, the EF1A has three domains. One is what is called as the G domain. Second is the domain 2 and the domain 3. It is very clearly observed that the G domain is made up of several helices. 
in its motif along with a few beta sheets while the domain 2 and the domain 3 are primarily composed of the beta sheets this is comparable to eftu so when you look at eftu you will find that the uh, gtp binding domain or the gtps activity of the eftu is is similar to the g domain of the ef1a and you have a uh, domain which is similar to domain 2 and another domain which is similar to domain 3 and interestingly what has been observed is that the g domain has not just the gtpas activity but it also has a binding site for gtp so when one looks at extensively the three domains this is domain 1 this is domain 2 and the domain 3 and the domain 1 as observed has a region where the gd gtp and the gdp can bind now when you look at domain 2 the domain 2 uh is able to bind to the amino acyl trna so therefore the masking of the amino acyl trna at its acceptor arm is because of the domain 2 just like eftu was masking the amino acid at the acceptor arm of the trna in the prokaryotic system in the eukaryotic system the domain 2 of the eef1a is responsible for masking the amino acid at the acceptor arm of the trna now this portion is also a binding region for the second elongation factor 1 which is the eef1b alpha in fact there are three uh, subforms of eef1 beta and the most preferable uh, eef1b that comes and binds to the eef1a is the EF1B alpha. So basically, you would have the EEF1A having three domains that can bind to three different uh, um, subs, uh, three different uh, uh, components, and this portion is the component which is going to bind to the tRNA. So the domain two and the domain three together help in interacting with the amino acyl tRNA. now what is the role of eef1b so it has been observed that eef1b has a regulatory function consider that the initiator trna with the methanin is bound at the p site this is how the ats elongation complex is is set to go into elongation now to this would come and bind the trna that is brought into the entire ats subunit by the eef1 a and we know that eef1 a has a gtpas activity and has a gtp binding domain so this over here is the gtp that is associated with the eef1 and the domain 2 of the eef1 a is bound to the acceptor arm region of the trna so therefore invariably what is understood is that the eef1a is bringing in the cognate trna to the entire ribosome machinery now what is very important is that the anticodon arm of the trna that can carries the anticodon the anticodon should interact with the codon that is present at the a site so in the small subunit this is the region which is called as the decoding region and the ribosome has to do a correct decoding of the mrna that is bound to the small subunit and we all know that the mrna has been positioned in the small subunit in such a way that the start codon is interacting with the initiated trna and that has happened because the initiation factors scan the mrna through the 5 prime utr to locate the start codon and position the start codon at the p site so we repeat again at the p site is present the initiator trna thanks to all the initiation factors and now because of the eef1a you have the cognate trna coming and associating with the mrna at the a site and that mrna and the 
the tRNA are presumably at the decoding center of the small subunit of the ribosome. Now, if you have a correct codon anticodon interaction, then what is observed is that the e e e e sorry the eukaryotic elongation factor 1a has its gtpas activity enhanced because of this positioning being correct because of which you have the gtp of the elongation factor 1a getting hydrolyzed to gdp now in the form of the gdp eef eef1a the affinity with which the eef1a can bind to both the large subunit and to the trna decreases and therefore it is released now this gdp has a, an affinity to bind to the eef1a and therefore it is not easily released from this so in order for a, for the eef1a to get back the gtp okay the molecule EF1B is acting as a nucleotide exchange factor and replacing the GDP with a GTP. Now, when this is again associated with GTP, it can again go and bind to a cognate tRNA and that cognate tRNA can again be recruited to the ribosome complex. So, therefore, for the EF1A to be used again and again, it has to have its GDP being replaced by GTP, which is being carried out by EF1B, which is the nucleotide, ex uh, nucleotide exchange factor. Which means that if EF1B is not active, then you will not have the EF1A getting converted to its GTP form. And if that happens, it is going to slow down the process of translation because there would be less number of EF1A in a form that can bind to the cognate tRNA and bring it to the ribosome complex. And that is why it is considered to have a regulatory mechanism. If you look at the structures of EF1A GTP, this is a confirmation in which it is when it is bound to GTP. But when it is bound to GDP, you can see that the confirmation changes slightly. And in this confirmation, it does not have an affinity to bind to the tRNA and nor does it have an affinity to bind to the ribosome complex itself and therefore it gets released. And this is a very clear indication how EF1B, the one in grey, is able to bind to the EF1A and when it is present as an EF1A, EF1B complex, the EF1B replaces the GDP with a GTP. So effectively when you understand what EF1B does is that it basically is replacing a GDP with GTP. EF1B has two to three subunits alpha, beta and gamma and the function is equivalent to EFTS of the prokaryotes. Now proofreading at the decoding center is a very important phenomenon that the ribosome carries out. So what is essentially important for the ribosome is to decode the mRNA probably, properly and that decoding is, is nothing but proofreading of the synthesis of protein. So, uh, the ribosome cannot afford to allow a tRNA to bind to its codon which is not carrying the cognate amino acids. So, if you have a codon that codes for lysine, then the tRNA that should come and bind to that codon should be bringing lysine itself. So it must be lysyl tRNA and not any other tRNA. So that is something that has to be ascertained by the ribosome. So there are three to four different ways by which a ribosome can ascertain that the decoding is correct. So one way of asserting is that as soon as the EF1A, uh, elongation factor 1A, brings in the cognate tRNA and you have the codon and the anticodon interacting, if the codon and the anticodon interaction is correct, then 
the small subunit which has the 18s ribosomal rrna and this 18s ribosomal rrna is a huge rna which is folded and as it folds it forms several helices now one of the helix of the 18s rrna carries a conserved pair of adenines that is aa and this conserved pair of aa is going to hydrogen bond with the first two base pairs of the codon anticodon now this is very important therefore if the base pairing is correct that means if the codon anticodon base pairing is correct then the minor groove that is going to be formed is going to be is going to be correct and so this minor groove which is formed properly because of the correct codon anticodon interaction allows the aa to interact with codon anticodon so basically at this point of time you have three sets of nucleotides interacting with each other through hydrogen bonding so xx that is the first two codon first two nucleotides of the codon anticodon interacts with the first two codons of the codon and these two in turn interact with the aa which is part of 18s rrna so what is very clear over here is the 18s rrna present in the small subunit is associating itself with the mrna which in turn is associating with the anticodon which is part of the trna so effectively trna mrna and the 18s rna are all interacting with each other so if you have the aa of the 18s forming hydrogen bonds with the codon anticodon then this is the first checkpoint of the fact that the decoding is correct that is a correct trna has come and bound now a second way of ensuring that this codon anticodon is the correct codon anticodon is by a conserved g which is again present in the 18s rrna so as soon as the aa binds to the codon anticodon you will have another conserved g which will interact with all three to stabilize this structure further that means that becomes the second checkpoint now the third checkpoint or the third way of stabilizing this interaction or of ensuring that this is a correct or this is the correct decoding is taken care of by the one of the proteins in the small subunit and that protein is the s13 so the n terminus of the s13 30 positions itself on the codon anticodon interaction at the a site so now what you understand is and of course there is a uh, the third s30 has a conserved histidine and this histidine inserts into the decoding center and by inserting into the de decoding center it is stabilizing the interaction further so let us look at it again if you have correct codon anti so the first interaction that ensures that it is a proper decoding is the interaction between the codon and the anticodon itself if the codon anticodon interaction is correct then that is able to interact with the 18s rrna through a conserved pair of a if these three are correct then you have a conserved g which will also interact with this codon anticodon aa okay that is 18s rrna to stabilize this interaction further which means that if in the first place codon and anticodon interaction is not proper you will not have it interacting with aa and if this is not interacting then you will not have the g interacting so it is a kind of cascade of events but each event is basically trying to uh, look at the fact that it is stabilizing this interaction and if it is able to stabilize the interaction that means it is the correct trna that has entered the a site okay the third um, checkpoint is an interaction of a protein of the small subunit with the uh, a site if you have the correct anticodon and codon taking place so these three things are something 
that is ascertained by the entire ribosome complex. And interestingly now, when you have all these three happening or when all of these three takes place, then it is going to enhance the GTPase activity to convert the GTP of the EEF1A into EF1A GTP to EF1A GDP. So therefore, the conversion of GTP to GDP is the fourth checkpoint. Okay, so only when you have all these happening, you have the EF1A GDP being formed, which eventually will leave the ribosome complex. So effectively, the GTPase gets activated and the GTPase activity is again a, a checkpoint or is again something that is suggesting that yes, the tRNA that has come into the A site is the correct tRNA. Another important phenomenon that ensures or that enables the ribosome to ensure that it is the correct tRNA is by a phenomenon that is called as accommodation. Now, when you have the P site containing the initiator tRNA, and the A site containing the cognate tRNA that has been brought in by the, uh, sorry, that has been brought in by the uh, EF, uh, EF1A, okay. Once you have it interacting with the codon and interacting with the 18S RNA, the accommodation means that this tRNA twists by 180 degrees to change its composition. So from a position that is like this, it goes to a position like this. So this twisting of the tRNA at the A site is what is called as accommodation. Now, this is very clearly indicative of the fact that the twist is going to give rise to a strain. And so if the codon, anticodon, 18S rRNA, small subunit interaction is not strong enough, then the tRNA is going to fall off. Therefore, accommodation is again an important phenomenon that proofreads, that ensures that the tRNA that has come in is the right tRNA. Moreover, what is importantly noted is that the acceptor arms of the initiator tRNA and the tRNA at the A site face each other and coincide with the peptidyl transferase center. We all know that the peptidyl transferase center is part of the larger subunit and this peptidyl transferase center has a specific region of the 28S rRNA and that region of the RNA acts as a enzyme and therefore it is called as a ribozyme. So, peptidyl transferase center does not have any protein acting as an enzyme, but it is the rRNA itself that acts as an enzyme. So, there is a set of studies that have shown that the nucleotide of the ribosomal RNA plays an active role or pivotal role in the peptide bond formation. Now, interestingly, this peptidyl transferase center is very well conserved between both bacteria and the eukaryotes. Now, let us look at how the uh, peptide bond is formed. So, say this is the tRNA at the A site with the, with the amino acid present and you have the P site with the tRNA and the peptide present. Now, if it is initiator tRNA, you will have methionine present. So, what is observed is the amino group of the amino acid bound to the tRNA on the A site carries out a nucleophilic attack such that this peptide that is present or this amino acid that is present is shifted to this NH. So, you will have an intermediate form and eventually this tRNA on the P site getting Releakered from the peptide. So, effectively, the peptide that is present or the amino acid that is present on the initiator trans tRNA is transferred to the tRNA that is present on the A site. Okay, so therefore, that is very clearly observed is that you would have the amino group 
of the tRNA at the A site, so amino group of the amino acid that is attached to the tRNA, carrying out a nucleophilic substitution reaction and forming what is called as a C double O N H. So this is the peptide bond that is formed. Now, when the peptide bond is formed, the interaction of or the acyl group between the tRNA and the amino acid over here is broken. So, you effectively have the amino acid from this shifting to this tRNA and therefore now this tRNA will have a dipeptide. So, that is how the peptide bond is formed. As you can observe over here, this B can take up a proton from this reaction and therefore it has been found that the uh, base present in the rRNA can play an important role in the peptidyl transferase center and from this it was observed that the rRNA is responsible for carrying out the catalysis of the peptide bond. Now the next step after this is the step of translocation in elongation. Now, what do we mean by that? Okay, interesting to note over here is that once you have the peptide bond formed at the peptidyl transferase center, the initiator tRNA, which is at the P side, tilts to the E side. So, the deacylated de tRNA, because this tRNA contains now no amino acid or no peptide, so it is a deacylated tRNA, it tilts towards the E. So, it is partially on the E site and partially on the P site. So, this is the P site and you have the E site over here. While the amino acyl tRNA that is present on the A site is partially present now on the P site and partially present at the A site. So, you can already see that the two tRNA are moving towards their next locations. So, this initiated tRNA is moving from the P site to A site. Uh, sorry, P side to E side and this tRNA is already tilting towards P side. So, they are effectively partially already moving towards their next, uh, next pocket. So, effect, so, here what you observe is that although the tRNA is tilting towards the P side, the anticodon part of the tRNA is still attached to the codon of the mRNA. Now, the question arises is what enables this codon anticodon region of the tRNA also move to the P site? So, this is being taken care of by elongation factor 2. Elongation factor 2 has several domains, okay, about 5 domains, and each of the 5 domains have importance. With the first two domains of, uh, sorry, these, this first domain over here responsible for GTPase activity and the ability to bind to GTP. The fourth domain is mimicking the anticodon arm of the tRNA, which means that this portion has a set of three amino acids that can act as an anticodon. And so, this portion, domain four, of the EF2 can interact with the A site, can interact with the A site. So, it can come and bind to the A site. So, the tip of the domain 4 has histidine and this histidine is, has been observed to be modified to a 2, something that is called as diphthamide. So, a histidine is uh, modified to diphthamide and this diphthamide seems to have a role to play in breaking the hydrogen bonding between the two conserved A of 18S rRNA with the codon anticodon. So, this, this interaction that the codon anticodon has with the 18S rRNA is disrupted because of the uh, elongation factor 2 domain 4. And that is important because it is loosening the hold of the tRNA on the small subunit, on the 18S rRNA. So, here the flexibility has increased greater. Now, what is very important to notice that EEF2, that is elongation factor 2, mimics 
Elongation factor 1A GTP amino acyl tRNA ternary complex. That means this exhibits what is called as biomimicry and it is mimicking the complex of EF1A GTP amino acyl tRNA. Therefore, its GTPase activity can also have a regulatory role. Now, you can see how the EF2 because of its domain 4 is able to be present at the A site at the decoding center and it has a GTP associated with it. So when you have the EF2 associated with GTP, it is in a confirmation that come, can come and interact with the A site and when it comes and interacts with the A site, this region has a histidine which has been modified into diphthamide and that diphthamide is breaking the bond between AA and the codon anti codon of the tRNA mRNA at the A site. So, once you have that happening, this EF2 pushes the tRNA from the A site to the P site. Now, because you have the anti codon of the tRNA associated with the codon, when the tRNA moves from A to P, the codon that was present in the A site also moves to the P site. When that happens, the EF2 which is present at the A site without the tRNA gets a little destabilized. Its GTPase activity increases and the GTP is converted to GDP and in the form of the GDP, this has no longer affinity to bind to the A site and it will be released. So now therefore, what do we have? We have at the E site, the deacylated tRNA. We have at the P site, that tRNA that was present on the A site having moved to the P site and now you can see that it is carrying a dipeptide. So therefore, effectively the P site is called as the peptidal site. Because all tRNA of the A site which carries the peptide will eventually move to the peptidal site. So, A site becomes free again. You can see that the next codon at the A site will again be free to bind to another cognate tRNA. So, the deacylated tRNA okay, slowly and gradually moves out of the A site and therefore what you again have is just the ribosome complex with the tRNA at the P site carrying the dipeptide or carrying the polypeptide. What does this mean? This means that now the elongation complex is again ready to carry out the next round of elongation. Interestingly at this point it has been observed that initiation factor 5A has been found to be associated with translation elongation. EF3 has the role of EF2 in certain fungi and certain other species. So generally it is EF2 but in some species it is not exactly this uh, EF2 but it is EF3 that does the same job as EFT. So we know that EF2 is equivalent to EFG of the prokaryotic system. So just to get an overview again. When you have at the P site the tRNA carrying the peptide and you have the EF1A uh, bringing in another cognate tRNA and when this cognate tRNA binds the ribosome through several checkpoints ensures that it is a stabilized interaction and when it is a stabilized interaction uh, the GTPase activity increase uh, is enhanced and the GTP gets converted to GDP. So that is now going to leave the ribosome complex leaving behind the tRNA with the amino acid. Next what happens is there is accommodation so you can see that this tRNA has twisted bringing the amino acid on this tRNA closer to the dipeptide that is present on this tRNA. So both the all the sets of amino acids and peptides are now present at the peptidal transferase center and is ready for peptide bond formation. So therefore, 
peptide bond formation leads to the dipeptide from this tRNA getting shifted, transferred to the amino acid on the uh, tRNA over here to form the tripeptide. Now, at this point, it is very important to note that no exogenous energy is being used but there is a breaking of the bond happening between this tRNA and the di dipeptide. So, an energy, a certain amount of energy is definitely required over here. Now, once you have this uh, tripeptide formed, you know that uh, the tilting of the tRNA to its next pockets already begins. So, this is partially at P site and partially at E site. This one is partially at A site and partially at P site. So, to complete translocation, EF2 comes and binds and EF2 pushes the tRNA and the mRNA to the P site. And once that happens, this EF2 now is released, okay, and you again have the A site empty. So, to this A site again an EF2 sorry, an e, uh, EF1A with the cognate tRNA can come and bind. So, there, therefore, this is how cycles of trans uh, elongation continue to happen. And with ev for every peptide bond formed, you have over here one GTP being used. You will have an ATP being used. Why do we consider this as ATP? Because a charged tRNA, that means the 3 prime CCA group of the tRNA is binding to an amino acid through an acyl bond and that acyl bond formation has used an ATP. Now, when that acyl bond is broken, energy is released. So, therefore, when you have the tRNA getting charged and ATP is being used and that ATP stores the energy in the form of acyl bond, so, here when the acyl bond is broken, the energy is released and that energy is used to form a peptide bond. So, indirectly one ATP is being used over here and the second ATP is being used, sorry, second GTP is being used when you have the EF2 translocating. So, therefore, for every peptide bond that is formed, you will have three energy molecules being utilized. So, this is how the elongation will continue until at the A side you would have the stop codon present. So, let us make, a, make the conclusions. The initiation of the elongation phase is with EF1 AGTP bringing in a charged cognate tRNA to the A site. The ribosome through several checks ensures that the correct tRNA is present on the A site. This includes EF1A GTP getting hydrolyzed to EF1A GDP. The heart of the elongation step is in the formation of the peptide bond between the acylated tRNAs at the A and the P site. This is catalyzed by 28S rRNA present in the 60S. The EF2 translocates the tRNA and the mRNA such that the A site is vacant, vacant again to enable another charged cognate tRNA to bind to the A site. This process continues until stop codon is present on the A site. Elongation phase of the translation therefore is coordinated by elongation factors with formation of a peptide bond per translocation that in turn requires energy molecules. This mechanism is similar that in the prokaryotes. Thank you.